comprised of consumers and family members. Um, we look at bringing training opportunities to counties and to communities so that everybody can access employment opportunities that may be available in their, in their respective communities um, within the county public mental health system. So part of that is looking at what are the barriers to um, workforce development or to employment for people. One of the barriers that has been identified has been when people may have a criminal background um, which creates an impediment to them getting hired or, or that they think that that may create an impediment or a challenge to them being hired. So we're providing the webinar this morning so that people have adequate information um, to reduce any barrier that a criminal record that they may hold may have on, on them a, their ability to access um, jobs and to apply for jobs and to get employed within public mental health. We understand that many people on the call this morning are not necessarily from the public uh, mental health sphere, and we welcome um, your participation as well. So um, without further ado, I think I want to give a little bit of background for the call this morning. As I, as I mentioned, Working Well Together is about supporting the public mental health force um, and workforce development. We're offering the call yeah, to I'll, uh, I'll try to work you out. a time frame um, in which we tradi traditionally have a um, workforce education and training call through CINH. Um, yeah, and I'm going to pause for a moment and ask that if there's background noise happening, if you have folks um, who are you know, in the room with you and, and speaking, that if you can put yourselves on mute, that would be appreciated. Um, and then you can unmute if you have a question or, or something like that. So thank you very much for that kind of webinar etiquette. So again, um, this webinar is being offered during a time frame that's normally scheduled for workforce education and training um, coordinators in county public mental health across the state. And it's a call that um, Adrienne Shilton um, typically will host. Um, she's graciously given us that time slot this morning, and we've opened this up to be an hour and a half long webinar in order to offer the topic that I mentioned earlier. So Don Landis is um, an assistant public defender through Monterey County. And um, he uh, was invited to attend a planning council meeting for the um, uh, Department of Mental Health a couple of months ago and to speak to the issue of criminal record expungement and how, how folks can overcome their barriers to employment um, if they have a record. So um, after hearing from him, it became uh, quite clear that we needed to get this information out. And so without further ado, I'd, I'd like to introduce Don Landis and welcome him to our audience this morning. And um, Don, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit further and tell people um, maybe how you've been participating in other activities um, more recently sure. around this sure. issue? Sure. Uh, and I hope everyone can hear me. And I hope that everything's working well. This is, the technology is really pretty incredible. I uh, want to give you a little background about myself. I've been a career public defender for the last 20 years, and I uh, was working in Orange County for the last 18, doing uh, trial work and uh, writs work and, and appellate work. I've since moved up to Monterey to become the assistant public defender, and I'm in the management end of it. But I um, also am responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the office, some of which includes uh, taking calls from clients who want to move on and move forward in their life to clean up their record and to uh, get the job that they need and the job that they want. And so it's uh, become my duty uh, to uh, leave the attorneys from the responsibility of filing motions to dismiss or expunge uh, their clients' records and to take it upon myself to learn the area and then to develop a program from my office uh, so that we can respond to uh, the overwhelming response right now to clean up the record. This economy has been uh, just devastating, as everyone knows, on um, the indigent, and it is for employment uh, if someone has a criminal record or not. And so we've had people lining up around the office, you know, trying to get their uh, records cleared. And so um, 
we've been uh, making a concentrated effort to develop a program in our office. And so I started um, searching around for information on the subject matter and found that there is a lot of material out there and there are some great programs that have been developed. I've also found uh, how woefully inadequate California's system is in terms of expunging someone's record uh, to allow them to move beyond the scarlet letter uh, uh, mentality that California's had for the first 30 years. And some of the reason why I've uh, wanted to go out and give lectures and to talk about the subject matter is to really bring it home to people uh, how uh, we need to move beyond this retribution mentality of uh, our criminal justice system and allow people to uh, be better than their worst mistake in their life and oh, the bad choices that they've made and to be able to move forward and move on and become productive members of society, not just remain in the, um, in the, the world of being an ex-felon with nowhere to go and, and no opportunities because of his prior record. Um, and so uh, why I'm really giving this uh, speech is, you know, in, immediately is to give you the information in hand but also for uh, you all to contact and to mobilize and to uh, uh, make a effort with your uh, representatives and your politicians in your area uh, and as well the collective conscious of California to move it forward and pass the scarlet letter That's mentality that we had and the retribution uh, only that we because had. we merged with them but our corporate office is still the and so uh, what I'm trying to do is bring that uh, message to everyone and to uh, especially you all uh, across California. Um, the, uh, the various public defender offices are the uh, offices where uh, you can get relief if you want immediate relief uh, to sit for assistance for these programs. And the big public defender's offices like San, uh, like, um, San Francisco, Alameda, Orange County, Los Angeles, and San Diego have all excellent programs. Uh, there's also some other um, public agency um, uh, organizations out there that have done extensive work in this area as well and provided great documentation as well. And I've provided all that document. I've provided their websites at the end of my lecture so that you'll have access to them and to access to their forums. I also want to reference that um, I've picked out all the important um, documents I think that you'll need immediately to help and fill out and to help your clients through the process. Um, but it always helps uh, these, these public defenders, uh, these public defender organizations have, um, uh, have great uh, resources and the lawyers available to uh, make it happen for you. So um, make sure you contact them if you have any confusion. Finally, you also uh, can use um, me as a resource. Uh, you'll see, you obviously see my uh, address and telephone number up there along with my email address. And I want to uh, tell you that you can access me and use me as an information source whenever you want. And I'll get back to you as soon as we hope as possible with uh, whatever answers I can bring up for you. Um, finally, I'd like uh, my lectures to be uh, a little, uh, to be give and take, to have questions and answers as we go along. Um, I appreciate the dialogue because oftentimes this can get confusing and to have a question pertinent to the uh, topic or to, to pertinent to the particular area of the law that I'm talking about so there's no confusion so that you can uh, then move on and um, and uh, not be confused as I'm going on with the rest of the lecture about a salient uh, topic that I just talked about. However, if you have any personal questions that relate to your own case or a particular case that you're working on, in, especially in a situation like this, it's probably best to uh, uh, ask that question at the end of the lecture or to um, email me with that uh, in
and so that the rest of the audience doesn't have to hear or listen to the particular facts of a particular case or your particular question regarding your own uh, concerns or issues. So uh, if you don't mind, uh, if there's a question about a legal principle that I'm talking about, then by all means let's have that question and I'll answer it along the way. But if there isn't, then um, uh, we'll, uh, uh, we'll, uh, I'll answer it after or by email. Hi, Don. Can yes. you resize your um, PowerPoint? The top part of it is cut off, and people are having a hard time seeing the whole image. I'm not sure how to do that because it's a, it's they're coming up on my screen appropriately. Hmm. I can go like this, and then does everyone see it now? Yes, yep. I, I see it. Uh, but it's not going to be in the play f uh, function. It'll be as you see it as we're going along. Is that all right with everyone? Okay. Um, well, I'm going to go ahead and go forward then, and um, and I'll leave it in this mode. Thanks, Don. Okay. So uh, as I have explained, uh, the um, California's laws are very inadequate in this area, and we are definitely not on the vanguard in terms of helping our um, prior felons, our prior uh, you know, defendants to move beyond their uh, to move beyond their, uh, their crime. These are the the, the main areas that uh, you can clean up your past, and these are the main topics that I'll be talking about. The first one is early termination of probation. Many of us, uh, many of our clients are on probation, and uh, you can get it uh, terminated early if uh, there are compelling reasons. The next is reducing your felony convictions to misdemeanors. This is very important in all sorts of uh, fun federal funding situations, as well as uh, other rights that can be restored as a result, and then for private employer uh, questions that can or can't be asked. The next area, and it's the area that's uh, mo of most interest in that it has the greatest bang for your buck in terms of uh, getting your record cleaned up, is the dismissal, or uh, as we euphemistically call expungements. The next area is certificates of rehabilitation. It's not a dismissal, but it's a recognition uh, from the government that you have uh, moved beyond your criminal ways and are now become a productive member of society. Uh, the other, uh, and that leads to the next, is traditional pardon, because a certificate of rehabilitation is what you have to first file before you can uh, apply for a traditional pardon. And the last area is the area that um, most people wish the uh, expungement process uh, was about, uh, but in reality is the least um, easy to obtain and to uh, clear your record with, but it's what everyone really wants the system to ultimately become. Um, however, uh, given California's current pro-prosecution climate and uh, the police officer's uh, desire to hold on to any information at all for any future um, potential crimes, and then, uh, as the public recently uh, displayed in those two, uh, that case down in San Diego with the uh, uh, convicted sex offender who killed those uh, two high school girls, there is a wide uh, condemnation of the parole office as well as the prosecution, the district attorney's office down there for having destroyed his records. Uh, because there is a uh, trend in the government to destroy records after five years with the prosecution and after seven years with the court. And I'm sure your governmental agencies have similar record retention policies and destruction. I know at the Public Defender's Office, we, um, we keep our records forever, but that's not uh, how most offices are. Um, Uh, get, uh, well, here's the problem. All right. Um, I'm not sure if I can move on to the next. Okay. 
I, I apologize. It's going to be a, a problem for a second. We're willing to wait, Don. Thanks so much yeah, for your Yeah, and your just work. Uh, this program uh, is, uh, I'm going to have to do this. We'll move on to the next screen. Can people still see it? Yes. Yes, I can. Okay. All right. Uh, early termination of probation. Uh, this is important whether on probation because if you're on probation, then uh, you can't get any relief for any exp uh, expungements or dis dismissals. So the first road to um, the very first road to uh, uh, cleaning up your record is to get off any grants of probation that you're on. And you'd be surprised how many people who want to clean up their records, but then when you start talking to them, you realize, well, they're on probation here and they're on probation there. And so uh, the code's very clear that you have to be off of probation first before you can get any kind of relief. So the first thing you want to do is try to uh, take their uh, probation and end it. And uh, the authority is under Penal Code Section 1203.3. But uh, courts are usually loath to take you off of probation uh, early unless you have a really compelling reason. Now, sometimes you negotiate it as a part of your deal so that you're on probation for a year. But if you do well, then the probation can be dismissed upon request. But uh, oftentimes, probation lasts from anywhere from three to five years. And if you want to get off early, um, then you better uh, have a good reason, like it's a problem with the job or uh, you've done really well and you want to go to school and this is an impediment to that. Uh, there is a little softening of this in that uh, budgetary problems uh, are forcing probation departments to be smaller and smaller. And so with their caseloads going up, they're coming and looking for more inventive ways of uh, dealing with their probation charges. And so one way is early termination. Uh, but they only terminate those with the, the possibility of the least uh, offensive or violent pass. And so, um, you know, uh, you're not going to get off of uh, assault with a deadly weapon, felony probation early. But if you have a simple petty theft and you have done well and paid all your fines and did all your counseling and uh, paid all your restitution, uh, then the courts will be more inclined to do that. So, uh, so that's the first avenue. Um, and paying your fines uh, is really important, and paying restitution is really important nowadays to the courts who are cash-strapped. Uh, so uh, make sure, and that could be difficult with indigent clients. They don't necessarily have the money uh, to do that. And there are ways of arranging for fines to be paid through community service, and so that can be done through a sentence modification as well, too. So there are creative ways of handling the fine situation as well. That leads to uh, reducing felony convictions to misdemeanors. Uh, that's done under, uh, under Penal Code Section 17B. And that's where the trial court reduces a felony conviction to a misdemeanor. Uh, in that instance, uh, felonies are, um, are, are, are the most serious crimes. And so uh, when a police officer sees a felony conviction on your record, he is that much more careful and that much more suspect of you and your actions. Well, so to our employers, it has a greater um, uh, level of concern if you've been convicted of a felony as compared to if you've been convicted to a misdemeanor. And so there's a psychological uh, aspects of it, but there's also uh, legal aspects of it that are very important as well, too. Um, the definition of a felony are uh, any crime that can be served in state prison or in the county jail. Uh, but you can only reduce felonies that are called wobblers, and that's a, a legal term of art. Uh, it's kind of a silly name, but it basically talks about uh, it wobbles on being charged as a felony or being charged as a misdemeanor. And uh, if the punishment includes state prison or county jail, then it's a wobbler. But if it includes um, state prison only, then it's not a wobbler. And a perfect example of a a non-wobble offense that will remain a felony conviction forever are uh, possession of cocaine 
interestingly, as compared to possession of methamphetamine, which is a wobbler, and um, meth is far more uh, uh, problematic in our society right now than cocaine, but uh, there's greater relief for it, which is a kind of an, an, an interesting anomaly. Uh, other areas are residential burglary. That is a, uh, a non-wobbler offense that always remains a felony as compared to a commercial burglary. Uh, we uh, do a burglary of a, a business and that is a wobbler so that can be um, that can be filed as a that can be uh, reduced to a misdemeanor if properly um, motioned and that's what the 17b is about. Uh, as we just discussed, uh, you can't reduce a felony to a misdemeanor if it was a non-wobbler, as I've just expo uh, stated, and that means uh, uh, that means that you can only go to state prison on it. The other aspect is that if you've been to state prison, then uh, you can't get relief to reduce your felony to a misdemeanor. Uh, that's kind of the uh, salient uh, theme through it, that if you go to state prison, you're basically marked for life and you're behind the eight ball forever, and there's little or no relief from that. And um, you'll see that as a common theme through uh, the various different uh, ways of um, uh, cleaning up your record. Uh, the last disqualification is kind of a, 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 a hyper-technical um, issue. It involves whether a state prison executes a sentence has been suspended. Basically, the judge imposes state prison but suspends the sentence uh, pending your successful completion of probation. That's another instance where you can't get it reduced to uh, uh, a misdemeanor. Um, the other uh, good part about um, uh, reducing to uh, a misdemeanor is that you can all at the same time in uh, with three different motions in one court visit, uh, get off of probation early, reduce your felony to a misdemeanor, and then have that misdemeanor dismissed under uh, the three code sections. Uh, the first one, the 1203.3, 17B, Penal Code se Section 17B, and then Penal Code Section 1203.4, which I'm going to talk to you about in a second. So all of them can be done um, all at the same time in one fell swoop in the courts. Um, as uh, I don't know if I mentioned uh, in the beginning uh, or if the moderator uh, explained as well too, I've uh, put together all the, uh, all the necessary forms for you to do all this and they'll be uh, available for you uh, I think next week at the website uh, that includes my PowerPoint presentation along with my motion, uh, my various motions. These are court forms that you can get from the state court website. You can also get them from the uh, various county superior court websites as well too. I know Monterey County has their own particular forms and that's a holdover from the days when the county used to run the superior courts and then the states used to run the appellate courts. Back in the early 90s, the states took over the entire court system and they're trying to formalize and standardize all the superior courts in the various different counties into one system with one set of forms. But uh, each county that you uh, are, are living in and have clients that uh, live in, those county courts have their own uh, forms that are similar, consistent with the statewide forms uh, uh, to uh, expunge your record. Uh, I've provided the state forms uh, because the county courts that you're in must take those forms as well too, and eventually they're going to become the standardized forms anyways. Uh, and they, they all do the same thing, that judges um, don't care either way. It sometimes is a little more difficult for the court clerks who are more used to their local county uh, forms than the state forms, but as we progress forward in the court consolidation, that's less and less of an issue, especially nowadays. So the forms that you have and have access to uh, with this website, uh, along with my uh, PowerPoint presentation, uh, should help you uh, do everything that I am lecturing today. Uh, I have a, I have a great law clerk this last uh, semester as well, too, who put together a very informative how-to sheet for our clients so the clients could read and um, 
and then uh, with that explanation know if they qualify and then uh, use the particular forms involved and that's also on the website. It's not in Spanish yet though and I'm still working on the Spanish. I'm also trying Don? to work on yeah. Um, this is Donna Matthews with Working Well Together. Um, some of the um, folks who are listening in are having a hard time hearing you. I can hear you fine, but if it's possible to speak up a little bit. Um, I know people are having a little bit of audio problem, and that might be helpful for them. Is this, does this sound better? Um, I'll wait, and I'll, I'll see what other folks say if anyone emails me and, and says that they're still having difficulty. But um, also, just for the audience to know, we are recording this webinar, and it may be also helpful to, um, if you want to play it back next week when we have it posted on the website, that may, that may be another option for you if you can't resolve the audio problems today, and we apologize for that. Well, I'll talk up, and uh, hopefully the mic, uh, I'll put the mic a little closer to my mouth as I'm talking. Okay, thank you so much. That's sure, not a problem. Um, so anyways, all those motions and uh, short explanation sheet are in there, and um, it should help you if there's any questions you have on any of the, the motions there, by all means, email me or call me, and I'll get back to you as soon as, as quick as I can on this particular matter. And uh, if there's any continued problems uh, that you're having, um, I can either direct you to an organization that can help you or I can help you myself. Let's move on to reducing felony conviction. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let's uh, finish talking about the benefits of uh, reducing a felony conviction to a misdemeanor. Um, you can lawfully say you've never been convicted of a felony. That's a big deal. Obviously, it increases your job potential. It restores your civil rights, uh, which are very important. Uh, voting, uh, serving on juries, which everyone loves to do, and uh, as well as um, uh, other aspects uh, of uh, civil society, like even um, running for office. Uh, it may restore some of your firearms rights uh, if it's not a violent crime, but I have to area, I tell you this area of the law is very um, fraught with uh, legal questions that are still being worked out in the appellate courts. And in fact, the U.S. Supreme Court just heard argument on a very important gun possession case uh, that involves states, uh, state law restriction, and uh, everyone in the legal community is waiting to see how that comes out because it's going to have drastic changes on all of California's gun laws. Um, it removes blocks to certain professional licenses, uh, but you need to check with your, your particular agency to see how it does or doesn't affect. Um, and that's a big issue. That's a big problem. We have oftentimes questions from nurses, from teachers, from real estate um, salesmen, doctors. Uh, their licenses, uh, it affects dramatically. I know it, it affects your ability to become a lawyer as well, too. The State Bar does extensive background checks, which I'm sure most professional licensing agencies do as well, too. And if you've got a felony, you have a lot of explaining to do. If you have a misdemeanor, it's not as much explanation or none at all. Um, I've also known, uh, I've noticed, <coughs> and we especially have it with uh, the youth that come in today that pick up some kind of drug charge, and then uh, they get beyond it, and it was at uh, one time the youthful indiscretion, and then they want to apply for college and for student loans and or student housing, uh, which are all federally uh, oftentimes federally funded and they're not uh, they're refused because of the felony conviction. I know uh, also a lot of my clients uh, who have uh, mental health issues or physical issues when uh, the various programs that I've gotten them into are federally funded or they're trying to get federal assistance through SSI or through Social Security or through some kind of medical, medical or Medicare. If there's felony uh, convictions in their background, it's almost impossible to get the relief ne needed. So that's the other important reason to have, um, uh, to get it reduced to a, a misdemeanor. Uh, and then it has huge implications on immigration. And uh, the U.S. Supreme Court just came out with a case called Kentucky versus Padilla just, uh, just last week that reemphasized how important criminal convictions are as it relates to immigration and that it rises to a level of constitutional and effective assistance of counsel 
if we don't properly advise as a result of the um, immigration consequences. And uh, having uh, a felony on your record is almost sure assured you to be deported. But having misdemeanors uh, with less than a year of custody time uh, means you have a fighting shot at not getting deported. And we all know of the families who have had kids that you know came over here when they were a year old, don't know or speak any Spanish, and then get into trouble at age 18 or 19. And the next thing they know, they're finding themselves deported back to Mexico with no family there not knowing how to speak the language and really little or no recourse. I see that all the time. And so this relief is very important in those situations. Don, we had a question about what is the definition of a misdemeanor? Could you just um, remind people about what that is? Sure. A misdemeanor crime is a crime that the maximum punishment is a year in the county jail, and that's the maximum punishment. Usually the majority of misdemeanors are a maximum punishment of six months. Where, uh, but there are f uh, a, a few, and it's growing, that are up to a year in the county jail. Any <laughs> crime that can be served in the county jail or in state prison uh, are felonies. And so a felony uh, includes the punishments of as great as state prison. So that's really the defining uh, aspect between a felony and a misdemeanor. Obviously, misdemeanors are less serious crimes and felonies are more serious, and we, we reserve state prison as a sentence for the more serious crimes, which are the felonies. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, the drawbacks are of, uh, if you get, uh, and we often sometimes have defendants who say, look, I got it reduced from a felony to a misdemeanor. How can they charge me with that as a strike conviction? And uh, what a reduction, um, does is it's a reduction of the sentence, but it's not a reduction of its um, prior ability, meaning its ability to be used in the future to enhance your sentences on future crimes. And uh, as for misdemeanors, this is most prevalent in the DUI situation, in, in drunk driving situations where your prior convictions, even though you get them reduced or dismissed, they can still be used as prior convictions to enhance your sentence for future cases. The uh, strike priors are the other thing as well, too, um, where um, they can use, be used to uh, double your sentence or to give you life imprisonment, even if uh, you've been successful in getting them reduced to uh, a misdemeanor um, after the fact. It's when you plead guilty that determines their prior ability, not what the ultimate sentence was that you received. <clears throat> Let's move so, on. There's to, a question okay. about um, whether or not California voting rights are automatically restored once a person is off parole. Did you speak to that? From what I understand, that's correct. And, and there has always been a big movement among the public defender offices to get us to inform our clients that once they get off of uh, parole, and I actually think it's, uh, I think they can vote while on parole. It's just once they get out of state prison. Uh, if they've been physically in state prison, I don't believe they can vote, but once they've been out of state prison but still on parole, they can vote. Uh, but it's for sure after parole is ended, and I, I should clarify that. Um, I know I've uh, read discussions on that, uh, but uh, it's definitely after the parole, the voting uh, rights have been restored. That's not how it is necessarily across the different states in, in, in America, but California has provided that relief at least for its uh, parolees and ex-cons who have gotten off of parole. Great, uh, thanks. The dismissals are, uh, this is the big area. This is where, like I said, the greatest bang for the buck. This is where we can do the most good, despite how woefully inadequate I think California system is all about. Uh, we, we usually call it expungement, I and mean, that's the term of art, that's the, uh, the slang term that we use for it. And I've really been trying to, after I've been getting into this uh, uh, legal research and giving these lectures, I'm really trying to train myself not to say expungements anymore, but instead, instead say dismissals. Because the distinction really shows you how inadequate it really is and how what a misnomer everyone thinks it is uh, in terms of cleaning up your record. Um, when 
if I hear the word expungement, that to me means, you know, clean, to erase, to not execute, to, to remove, uh, so that there's not any record of it. And uh, in what in reality exists is it's a dismissal. And uh, this uh, case, People versus Vasquez, really, um, I think, uh, uh, defines it the best in that it, it, the conviction doesn't disappear and the defendant is released from all penalties and disabilities resulting from the offense. The limitation will be for numerous and substantial. That's, I think, a, a blowing, uh, blowing uh, definition of what the dismissal process is all about. But it really shows you that it's not a true expungement. And so we, I, I think we need to teach our lawyers to say dismissals because I think it raises the um, it really raises the uh, expectations of our clients otherwise to um, think that they're not going to ever have to deal with that again in a job interview or in a state job that they've applied for and there's some kind of background check and it's come up and you know oftentimes what I've heard is but I got that dis you know I got that expunged I got that removed from my record well, I have, you know, I have to really tell you, in this age of the NSA, uh, who look and read our emails, uh, billions of our emails every day, and uh, the uh, with the Patriot Act and its vast um, extension into our privacy of our communications through uh, surreptitious uh, viewing, and with the uh, police agencies um, hoarding information and. Uh, solidifying their databases to have the greatest uh, um, information and intelligence, and they call it intelligence, uh, gathered on anyone and everyone. Um, it, there is really, in my view, um, no true expungement of one's criminal records. Uh, and we'll get into it in a little bit about uh, if you do get uh, your record sealed, what that really means in how I, you know, I, I just don't know. I, I, I'm really concerned if the government is really removing the information because there's no real true quality control on it, at least from the public sector of it, in terms of whether they actually remove it or not. Uh, I, I think another important discussion to have as well, too, is the age of the internet. You all are watching or listening to me as well as seeing my uh, presentation uh, across the internet. It has great uh, capabilities, uh, which I think are phenomenal. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it has a pernicious aspect of our privacy. And, and some of that is that uh, you do a Google search of anyone's name, and every, um, every little thing about your life is all of a sudden up on the website. There's also a recent um, webs, a website that my investigator found that um, uh, for thirty dollars a year, you pay this source, and, uh, and it's this internet site, so it's a, a website, and uh, you type in someone's name, and it gives addresses and telephone numbers of not only their current addresses, but all the places they've lived in the last twenty years. And the other thing that it does that was really quite chilling was uh, it trolls the Facebook, MySpace, LinkedIn. Uh, Paxo, uh, all these uh, you know uh, social networking websites, and it draws down their photographs of it draws down the photographs so uh, uh, from these the Facebooks and from the MySpaces, and so not only do you know their addresses and telephone numbers, and you know, I don't think it's bank accounts necessarily, but uh, you know the library cards and the traffic tickets and uh, all, and any court documents, along with uh, an uh, actual photograph of who that person is, it's really, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, very scary at the same time, too. And so, uh, no matter what you do to expunge your record legally, if it's on the net, you know, I, I don't know how you could prevent or, uh, you know, I know as an employer uh, hiring, I do MySpace and Facebook reviews of my young lawyers that I'm hiring because I want to make sure that they're good and upstanding citizens that don't have alcohol problems or don't have drug problems or aren't uh, into some uh, weird um, practice that's going to somehow inhibit their ability to be an effective public defender. 
And so uh, that's a problem in today's society, and I just don't know how to address that. Um, all I can address is the legal end of it. And so everything we do and say here is that it has to be tempered by the fact that all this could be theoretically out on the Internet as well, too. And so no matter how much you do to clean up your client so that he can get that federal funding or he can uh, get into that Section 8 housing, uh, if you have uh, a diligent federal or state worker who's also doing internet checks on the person, I don't know how you get by beyond that. So that being said, let's uh, talk about what we can do legally. Um, the authorities under Penal Code Section 1203.4 and Section 1203.4a, I give you these uh, code sections because it helps you decipher which forms you need to use. Uh, that I've also provided um, to get the relief that you needed. Um, to be able to uh, gain access of this dismissal, you need to have been granted probation, again probation, for a misdemeanor felony. And uh, the disqualifications are, and as, as I've said before, is uh, that you were state, sent to state prison. The next one is that you can't currently be on probation, and again, we talked just uh, discussed about how to terminate probation early. Uh, you can't be facing any criminal charges anywhere else, and that's a common slip up as well too. Well, I'll have someone come to me in Monterey and say that uh, you know I have to get my record committed to Monterey, and we're all excited, and it looks like they qualify, and then we find out from the DA in the response brief that. He's got a petty theft in, uh, in Santa Cruz County, and he's got a DUI out of uh, Alameda County that he's still working out and hasn't been resolved yet. And so then we can't get that relief as well. So they basically have to be out of the criminal justice system uh, before they can gain this relief. There can't be any outstanding warrants, uh, which would signify that there are still criminal prosecutions against you anyways. You can't be serving any sentence. Uh, that's another issue. We've got people that call us from the, you know, the county jail or from state prison and say, hey, I want to clean up my record. And I, I have to tell you, tell them, hey, well, when you get out of uh, jail, then let's talk. The other big one is uh, certain sex offenses, and we'll go over that as well, too. Um, and you know, that's a big area uh, that is um, a very problematic to get any kind of relief from, especially uh, in today's society uh, where we're very um, vigilant about uh, sex offenders and ensuring uh, the public safety and it's from this full spectrum of what happened in San Diego just a couple of months ago to um, clients who uh, were in, improperly uh, accused but pled to uh, reduce their exposure to the potential for the dramatic and draconian sentences that exist now for sex offenses. Um, again, uh, the sex offenses that aren't eligible and uh, are those listed and um, it, it's too early in the morning and it's too, uh, uh, we're too polite a society right now for me to explain to you the various different uh, sexual acts that would be required to uh, uh, fulfill these numbers. Uh, but there is some uh, that are eligible uh, if you fulfill the five grants below, uh, and that's that you can't, you, ha you must have been granted probation, on, and that's very difficult to do nowadays for sex offenses. Uh, you can't have been sent to state prison, which is usually what's happening nowadays. Uh, you have to successfully complete probation, and probation is very difficult to, uh, to uh, complete successfully um, given the increased focus, uh, especially on sex offenders. They have special sex offender units and probation departments that really uh, you spit on the wrong sidewalk, and that's a probation violation, and oftentimes rightly so. Uh, you can't be facing any other criminal charges, and you must not be in probation for, for any other offense. So uh, Don, are, we have a yeah. couple of questions. Can um, okay. yeah. Kristen Dempsey, I think you have a question? Are you able to ask it? I, I can't hear her if you could relay the question. Okay. Um, I am checking to see if she's typed in her question. So folks, um, if you do have questions, um, we are trying to unmute you, unmute you if you have your hand raised. 
But in the event that that does not work, please go ahead and type in your questions and we'll make sure to ask them for you. So if we don't hear from Kristen in a moment, let's go on. Okay. Yeah, I hear her typing now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, she doesn't have a question, she says. Okay. So if anyone else has a question, go ahead and um, send that to me, and I can ask it for you in case we have some audio difficulties with you all speaking. The uh, way you obtain a dismissal uh, is actually somewhat involved, and I provided, again, the forms uh, that exist to do this. But where you need to start that's the most helpful and the most helpful for your clients is uh, the California Department of Justice get their rap sheet, we call it their rap sheet, but it's their CLETS uh, form. And I don't know what CLETS stands for, California Law Enforcement Transcript. Maybe that's what it sounds like. That's the closest I've figured it out. But basically it's your rap sheet. It's, where all, it's all the crimes. It's anything you've ever been arrested for and anything that you've ever gone through the court system with and whether you've been convicted or, or, dis, or the case has been dismissed. And you're entitled to receive that uh, rap sheet for yourself, um, but it takes a little rigmarole to do that. And um, the, the first thing you need to do is re you have to request a live scan, and that's basically your fingerprints. You have to get fingerprinted, and with that fingerprint, uh, that uh, that confirms to the Department of Justice that you are the person that's asking for the rap sheet. And so uh, that area is tough to get any relief from in terms of the money spent. It costs about $20, and usually any police department and sheriff's department has a live scan it, uh, available. And these are machines that are somewhat expensive, and they're connected to the state database. And so you have to go to the, to the locations to find them. Anyone who's ever tried to uh, be a volunteer at a school or for a boys club or some, uh, some uh, event like that, life scan is something that we've all typically had to do. Um, and so you have to go get one, and it's $20. And I've given, at least in our tri-county area, uh, uh, places uh, that you can go get your life scan. Um, and, um, that, and again, like I said, most police departments or sheriff departments have them as well, too. I know the Monterey County Jail has one, and I wonder if each county, your jail, if your jail would have one as well, too. It also costs $25 to, uh, to get your rap sheet from the Department of Justice, but there is a fee waiver form for those who are indigent, and um, given the fact that all my clients are indigent, um, we get this fee waiver, but it's an extra form that you have to fill out, and it saves you at least the $25 uh, fee for that. And uh, for my clients, $25 is the difference between eating for a week and not, so it does make a difference. So I've included that fee waiver form for you as well, too. Great. Uh, we ahead. have a couple of questions. Would now be a, a good time to interrupt sure. and ask them? Sure. So we had one question from um, an individual asking, if you successfully get a sex offense expunged, does that remove you from the Megan's Law requirement registration? It does not. You have to uh, do an additional request with the Department of Justice, uh, the California Department of Justice, to have your name removed from the Internet site as well as the free disk that they provide. So that's a separate um, request to the Department of Justice, uh, but they usually honor uh, a court's determination to expunge a sex offender's record. And I've been successful in doing that. And I've gotten written confirmation from the Department of Justice, uh, the DOJ, uh, that they've done it. And then I've had my client's name removed from the Internet site. Whether there's some special database out there that they keep them on no matter what, I don't know. But at least from the public inspection of the uh, Internet um, notification, uh, they are removed from that. So that's a good question, and it can happen. You first have to go through the courts to get the record dismissed, and then you have to go to the uh, DOJ with their separate uh, request process to get removed from the Megan's Law. 
great. And then there's another question that when you're talking about state prison time, um, the question is when a person is released, isn't it always on parole and not probation? Um, because there was a reference before about needing to have been on probation to then want to do other steps. Right, that's also a very good question, and I'll define the distinction between probation and parole. Probation is uh, received uh, from the court if you are not sent to state prison but are in instead um, given a grant. It's, uh, it's a, a privilege of being on probation to the county and to the county probation department for your offense. But if you are sent to state prison, then you become, in essence, a ward of the state. You become the state's responsibility. And if the state assumes responsibility and they house you in the state prison and then you're paroled from the state prison, you are then the charge of the parole office, the state parole department. And um, so that um, you become a parolee with the state parole department. There are two separate agencies. One is on the county level, which is probation, and the other is on the state level, which is the, uh, which is the parole department. Um, parole is imposed upon you, whereas probation is uh, given to you as a, uh, as, as a privilege. And so there are two distinctions in that regard as well, too. But, uh, that's um, that's the difference between probation and parole. Okay. Is Great. there any other any other questions? Let's see. There have been several other questions. Um, let me just run through them really quickly. Uh, um, this has to do with a, uh, this is a kind of a tangential question. Okay. Um, if a person has um, has children, in this case, in California, and, and kidnaps them and takes them to another state, does that become a federal um, offense, or is, is that a federal state related? It can be both. It can be charged on the state and federal level, and it just depends upon what jurisdiction wants to act. Um, and so uh, the state can charge at the same time the federal government can charge. There's a state statute, though, that says that if there's a federal conviction for the same crime, for the same operative facts, then the state prosecution must be dismissed. And so, but that it doesn't, that's not exact, it, it doesn't work the other way around. So you can be convicted in the state for that offense, and then the federal government as a separate, as a separate sovereign can charge you and convict you and punish you for that exact same crime. There's no double jeopardy that's uh, attached at that point. California, though, recognizes it the reverse, and obviously they don't want to expend their funds if someone's going to do federal time, which is oftentimes much more difficult to do than state time. So. And Don, then we just had a clarification on when someone has their um, has a charge expunged, is it still showing up on a background check, even though it's showing up as expunged? Right, and I'm going to get to that in a second to, okay. to, to tell you how it shows up. Okay, thanks. So uh, once you've gotten your rap sheet and you know what your rap is, you know what your criminal records are, and it shows that uh, you have never been to state prison, that you've done all your probation, that you're, and that you paid all your fines um, and paid all your restitution, then you can move forward with a motion to dismiss. And uh, the, the um, state form, which is Judicial Council Form CR 180, is kind of like a one-stop uh, state form to reduce a felony to a misdemeanor and then have the case dismissed uh, under 1203.4 or in the instance of 1203.4a, a misdemeanor. There are, like I said, state, uh, county forms, and the next one, I have a petition to dismiss below, which is MC Superior Court Forms, MCR2-2a. Two, uh, That's the county form that we have in Monterey. You'll have a similar form in your county as well, too. Now, it costs $120 per case to uh, seek a dismissal of your case. and um, there's some there, there's been some appellate uh, case law uh, requiring that the 
the, this fee reflect the actual work done and not just a set um, a fee, uh, but that's currently being litigated. But generally, most courts across California charge you $120 per dismissal request per case. And that can get really expensive quickly if he has four or five cases that he's trying to get dismissed. Now, there's an application for a fee waiver, and that's form FW-001. My office uses it extensively. But in that application, you have to lay out under penalty of perjury your, your uh, monetary income for on a monthly basis. And the, the rule of thumb for most judges are that if you're making uh, less than $1,000 a month or have uh, a household of four and living on um, not much more than that, uh, that they're going to waive the fees to dismiss uh, the case against you. Uh, but a lot of times the clerks will require that you pay this money up front, and that's incorrect under the law. It's the court that decides whether uh, to impose the fee or not. So when you help your client with the forms, uh, and he uh, and you go to the court clerk's office to have the forms filed, and they say, "Well, we're not filing this unless you give me the $120." Then you need to talk with their supervisors because you need to explain to them that the law requires that they receive the dismissal request, uh, and that you want the court to decide at the time of the motion what fee needs to be imposed. You don't want the clerk to tell you what fee needs to be imposed. And a lot of clerks will get huffy with you about this and get upset with you. But the correct state of the law is it's the court that decides, not the clerks. And the clerks can't refuse uh, to, uh, ha to uh, receive your request, uh, but it just may take a little effort. And that's when it oftentimes is helpful to have a guiding hand of a public defender who knows the clerks and knows the system. And, we uh, routinely uh, don't, you know, we don't pay, the public defender's office don't pay for um, dismissal motions. Uh, we file the, the fee waiver. There are some counties that if the public defender's office files the dismissal, they don't even request a fee waiver. They assume that the public defender's office has um, done the necessary review to determine the indigency and uh, just accepts the public defender's refer uh, uh, reference that is the client's indigent. Uh, that's why it's sometimes nicer to work in coordination with your local public defender's office because they'll have the ends with the court and these special arrangements with the court, and they'll have the lawyers with the know-how to get it done, or the law clerks supervised by these lawyers to get it done. The uh, results of a dismissal is that, um, so I'm sorry, not the results necessarily, is that if you have no probation violations in your case, then a dismissal is mandatory. And oftentimes we'll check with the probation department and the, his probation officer to uh, determine uh, whether there was any probation violations or not. Probation violations are a matter of record as well, too, and, and they'll be in the court's uh, file as well. If there's no probation violations, then the trial court must grant the dismissal motion. It's a pretty powerful uh, tool if your client has been really good on probation. Now, uh, the majority of my clients don't quite make through probation unscathed, and so there's always a probation violation or two. And so then it becomes discretionary. And if it's discretionary, then we go to a little greater length uh, to uh, make our case, so to speak, for why the case should be dismissed. And I, I like to do this anyways, even with the mandatory dismissals, because I want the judges to know that there really are defendants out there that rehabilitate themselves and do uh, good work and move forward in their lives. In the criminal justice system, we become really cynical and jaded because we just deal with the, uh, the fringe of society every day, day in and day out. We just see the failure oftentimes, and that's what the criminal justice system is, is the failure of the, the social fabric uh, to you know, keep someone going and moving forward in life. And so j judges get jaded. So I'd like them to know that, no, uh, rehabilitation is important and is good. So I'd like to... Um, 
attached letters of support from friends, family, clergy, uh, teachers. Uh, I'd like to um, I'd like to show uh, employment by attaching uh, paychecks, and I love to show the judges my guy got himself into a trade school or into a local community college. And then the, the rehabilitation certificates from drug programs that they've done, uh, you know, AA chips, that's a great one. Um, those are so important for the judge to see, uh, even in the mandatory dismissals, that um, I would really encourage you to really show your client's best side to the judges so that in the future for our, all our future clients, the judge is just that less jaded the next time he has to uh, render a decision or make a determination on a discretionary grant of uh, dismissal. I just uh, want to throw in as well, too, there's a few misdemeanor convictions uh, for, for drunk driving is one of them where it's uh, mandatory. It's not, uh, I mean, it, where it's discretionary, not mandatory. And so you have to make the additional, uh, you have to make a, a greater effort than the certain vehicle code violations for dismissals. Um, the results. You can legally say that you, you weren't convicted if you get the case dismissed. The, your arrest record shows the charges are dismissed. Uh, one of the questions was, um, well, do they remove it from your record? And the, the answer is no. Uh, it, it, it doesn't say that it's been expunged. What it says is it's been dismissed. And so uh, when a police officer pulls up your record and they see that you were uh, arrested for a petty theft, that you were convicted for on such and such day for a petty theft, and that um, you were then, um, and then the charges, uh, you were placed on probation, and then the charges were dismissed, he'll see that you've gone through the full arc of uh, rehabilitating yourself. But he'll still see that there has been a conviction for it. And so in terms of uh, removing it from your record, it doesn't remove anything. It just indicates on your record that the charges have been dismissed. What it also does is it prevents private employers from asking whether you've had a misdemeanor conviction or not, and, uh, and they're not allowed to ask that. Now, uh, it's a it's a it's a regulation, it's a California regulations violation, but you know I don't know any good way of dealing with a uh, employer who asks whether you've been uh, convicted of a misdemeanor or not. If you say no. Um, and then they do an internet search and found that you have, uh, you know, and, and then they just don't offer you the job. You, don't, you won't ever really know. Or they out and out uh, uh, accuse you of lying even though they're not allowed to um, ask you about it. I mean, theoretically, you could file a civil lawsuit against them, but that doesn't help you get that job to uh, get that money, it's, you know, to live in the short term. So that's a problem. Um, I don't know how you prevent employers from asking uh, it, uh, other than a class action to, to prevent them from asking. Um, Excuse me, Don. We had sure. um, a question a few minutes ago, and I forgot to ask it, and it may still be applicable at this time. Does the dismissal and expungement tips that we're talking about so far apply to people who have successfully either completed parole or the courtesy parole, which is no. sometimes an option for folks? Yeah, no, it doesn't. Okay. And, uh, and, and it doesn't, and I'm going to get to who it does and doesn't apply okay, to. Okay, great. Um, disclosures, it's interesting that federal government, the, the, the government always protects itself, though, so it gives, it gives, um, it gives you relief, except for any job that involves the public office. So it's kind of funny that it's um, it, you know it, it's the one it's an exception, right? So uh, if you're applying for a public job, and you know in California the state government is the great, or the local government and the county governments, they're the greatest employers uh, in the county in, in the state. And so that, and that's where currently there's still some jobs, and so the so it's, it doesn't really help in that regard. Uh, state and local agency licenses, that's another big one. You know, the, anything that through the consumer affairs where you have to um, apply for a license, 
uh, that's uh, a problem. And then for all of us who want to work for the state lottery, that's another big issue as well, too. You have to tell them that you've been a convicted felon. Um, who it doesn't apply to. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what a dismissal does do is, um, and, and this is uh, kind of more the nuts and bolts of it, uh, it with, you withdraw your, your guilty plea. So uh, usually you come in, you're arraigned, you have the pretrial, you enter a plea, you are given probation, you have fines that you have to pay, and you complete that probation. When you get a dismissal, it withdraws your guilty plea, a not guilty plea is entered, and then the case is dismissed. And then, like I explained to you earlier, the criminal record shows a dismissal. And that's about both in the, the, the California Department of Justice and the FBI. I want to tell you the FBI has their own database, the Department of Justice has their own database, and local police agencies have their own database as well, too. The Department of Justice and the local police agencies um, have been working on linking their systems together, and so has the Department of Justice and the FBI, so there's a greater linking than there ever has been before of them. But you need to know that they're separate. Um, they are separate uh, um, databases. Uh, and again, you can say that you've not been convicted in a private job application. Uh, from what I, it, it helps you with some uh, licenses. It improves your credit rating. Um, it helps you with housing and loan applications. Like I told you, there's Title uh, Eight, you know, Section Eight housing, housing issues uh, that I've uh, had my local um, social workers uh, working with me and clients that they've had problems. And I've explained to you before, federal student loan eligibility. That's a big problem with these kids with drug offenses uh, that I've talked about as well. Either. Uh, what it doesn't do is, um, again, even if you've gotten a case dismissed, it can be used as a prior conviction. Uh, and for, I have explained already the strike uh, priors that we've talked about. It doesn't erase your record. It just is a, it's merely a, a retroactive dismissal. And uh, I keep on, you know, you keep on seeing it. It, it shows up as a, as a dismissal. That's really all it does. Um, it, it doesn't, it's not expunged from your record, it's not erased, it's not uh, taken away, it's just clarified that it's been a dismissal. It doesn't restore your firearms uh, rights unless you obtain the dismissal first and then get a certificate of rehabilitation and pardon. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, the, the, the pardon as well. Uh, you have to continue to register as a sex offender unless you get a dismissal and you get a certificate of rehabilitation after the dismissal is granted. And then again, you go through the De Department of Justice to have it removed from the, um, from the Megan's Law Internet site. Uh, some agencies won't recognize dismissals. I know the state bar is that way. And I know doctors and nurses' licenses are often uh, impacted upon that. And uh, I know there's been a big push for nurses' aides uh, that um, have uh, licensing aspects of it as well, too. But a lot of my clients um, who are trying to move beyond uh, go to a, you know, get their AA and then try to become a nursing aide, and then they run into this uh, licensing uh, issue with the state after doing a background check that shows their records. Uh, the other big one is uh, the DMV um, licensing status. Uh, DMV is a separate administrative agency, and believe me, they are onto themselves. Uh, they have their own rules and regulations, and no matter what you do in court, it doesn't impact their ability to take your license away or not. So even if you get something dismissed in court, it doesn't mean that your license status has been reinstated. You have to do that to the Department of Motor Vehicle yourself. Uh, and the other, and this is the big one uh, that everyone should know about. And uh, private and public employers may still ask about dismissed felonies. And the question, you know, the and my, the question most asked me is, well, you know, how do you suggest our clients talk about uh, their felony convictions that have been dismissed? And uh, my my view is, you always have to be honest and explain. And the reality is if you have two people who have similar quali qualities and who are just as equally apt to do the job, but one has a felony conviction and one doesn't, uh, 
we know where much more, more most employees are going to go, and you know that's just the hard realities of life, and it shows the limitations of California's laws in this uh, area, uh, and it's just an unfortunate aspect of current life in California. So, uh, but my uh, my view is that you have to admit the felony conviction, but state that the charges have been dismissed. John, real quickly, um, sure. uh, working for the census would be the same as having a government position, is that correct? That's correct, and in fact, I uh, worked with a bunch of clients uh, in the beginning of the year who were trying to clean up their records so that they could qualify for the Census Bureau. And I think the Census Bureau uh, weren't, they, did, they weren't concerned about misdemeanors, but they were concerned about felonies. And so, and one of my clients uh, with, had been sent to state prison, and as I'm about to talk of, uh, regarding certificates of rehabilitation and the limitations of that, we weren't able to clean up his record in time for him to be taking advantage of the census job that he wanted. Got it. Thank you. So uh, certificates of rehabilitation are and traditional pardons, and they're connected uh, but in some ways separate as well too are the catch-all for uh, those who don't fall in any other location, uh, it, it, any other relief. And so they're the catch-all. Uh, and um, the pinnacle sections uh, for adults and juveniles, I've provided you for certificates of rehabilitation right there. The requirements are the ones that get, uh, they get touchy of whether your client can take advantage of it or not. And, um, it's that seven to ten year residency requirement. Well, it's not residency. I'm sorry. Um, uh, washout period from your offense. Uh, that is the tricky part. Seven to ten years is a long time away, uh, but that's what the legislature has deemed is sufficient uh, for uh, before they even consider a certificate of rehabilitation. Uh, and that's the one that my clients get hung up the most. Uh, they'll want relief before the seven years. It can go up to ten years depending upon how serious the offense is. Uh, 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 vehicular manslaughter, I think, is the one that reaches up to ten years. But uh, it has to be seven years released from custody. And, and, and that doesn't include parole, but you have to be physically released from custody of some kind of penal institution before you can uh, obtain the relief. You have to be living in California for five years. They want to have a good track record of you being in California and it, it being worth their while for you to become a protective, a productive member of California's uh, citizen, citizens. That's another one that's tricky too because I've got clients that uh, in the winter months they might migrate down to Arizona to work in the fields down in winter and then they migrate back up here during the spring, summer, and fall months to handle the picking seasons here. And uh, so we get they get tripped up on that as well too if there's a winter domicile in Arizona or if they go to Mexico for uh, a month to visit a dying relative or if they uh, live in another uh, part of the United States for a while. Uh, that's a tricky part. And so uh, that's also a, a, an impediment uh, or a hurdle you have to get past. Uh, the, uh, interestingly, uh, as compared to other the relief, uh, the petition that you you uh, file for a certificate of rehabilitation is in the county that you live in, even though you've had offenses in other counties, uh, which is uh, different than the other um, relief sought where you have to get the relief from the court that the conviction occurred. Here, it's the county. You start with the county that you live in to begin your certificate of rehabilitation. Uh, John, those, quickly, yeah. um, let me interrupt just with one quick question, which is okay. probably especially relevant for the folks who work in public mental health um, and, and seek to support you know, folks who um, have mental illnesses. Um, if a person with who has had severe mental issues, uh, mental health issues, has been in and out of jail is the question, but is back on medications and doing well. Could their mental health, um, and I'm, I'm assuming the person means their improved mental health, somewhat in, assist in a dismissal or in maybe some of these other things that we're talking about, like certificates of rehabilitation? Uh, it, it's, uh, it's the cold, hard 
statutes and the language in the statutes that really apply. Now, um, human interest stories, you know, just as NBC worked really hard to humanize the Olympics to make it that much more emotional and really much, much more connected, uh, I, as a lawyer, want to humanize my client as much as possible to show the judge and to touch the judge's human heartstrings um, to show that uh, my client should be gain, given the benefit uh, that exists in the cold heart statutes. So it always helps to humanize your client and to explain to the court um, the tremendous road that they've traversed to get to where they are before the court, asking for the relief that they're asking for. Okay. Any other Great. questions? Great. Thanks. Great. Okay. Uh, so, uh, but certificates of rehabilitation, there are certain limitations that exist. Uh, one is that they don't want to waste their time on certificates of rehabilitation for any misdemeanor offenses, uh, except for certain sex offenses that are misdemeanor offenses. Uh, then they will, uh, then they want you to go that route. Again, there are certain sex offenses that certificates of rehabilitation won't touch, and these are really the bad ones. And like I said, the um, use of the child molest, case, uh, prolonged child molest or child molest uh, sexual offenses. Uh, you can't be serving a mandatory life uh, parole. I, I, it was funny. I had someone contact me from state prison asking for a certificate of rehabilitation. I looked into his case, and he was serving life without possibility of parole in, in prison. And, you know, I admired the thought process, but the, the, uh, the, there's no possibility for it in, uh, currently. Uh, and then obviously someone committed to death uh, in California can't. And I have one, and I don't quite get it, and I don't understand it, and I'd love to look into it more, and i got to believe there's got to be some traction legislatively on this, is those who are currently serving their military for some reason um, aren't provided the benefit of the certificate of rehabilitation. I don't get that. It could be a transiency issue because I, I live in a military uh, community in Monterey, and uh, they never uh, anyone in the military they never stay for more than three years in any location. So that may be some of the issues as well too. If you begin the process of a certificate of rehabilitation, and in the forms I gave you, the best example with the best, most complete packet came from the San Diego courthouse. And so I've included that in, uh, in the list of information. So um, use that as your guide, but check with your uh, local courts to see if they have their own forms. Uh, but uh, the, once you file that certificate of rehabilitation with the court, the district attorney's office, that local district attorney's office, does a, con, as a, as a, a background check on you. Then uh, if the court uh, and the, if the DA says, yeah, he's done well and he's uh, complied with all the requirements and he's an upstanding citizen, then the superior court, the local superior court judge will issue the petition. If it's granted, then it automatically is forwarded to the governor's office and, and, and it acts as an application for a pardon. Uh, and in essence, uh, you'll begin the process of a pardon at the same time too, but there's relief that you receive from certificates of rehabilitation in the meantime as your pardon is being considered by uh, the governor. Um, again, it's not a dismissal of the conviction, but it is an official court record of your rehabilitation. So you can uh, you know, proudly um, uh, state to your employers that uh, you've done well. Uh, it restores all your civil rights except certain gun rights unless the governor signs the pardon at the end. And it ends your duty to uh, register under Penal Code Section 290 for some sex offenses. And my, uh, uh, um, those are the most difficult. And I've done one in my legal career, and it was for a misdemeanor uh, child annoyance case from the early 80s. So it was a, quite an old offense, and he had uh, become uh, uh, quite a productive member of society in the interim. So uh, it's still really hard to do in California, but it is possible. And the certificates of rehabilitation are uh, what's uh, used to do that. The authority, uh, so, so uh, another area, as we've touched upon with certificates, is 
just a straight traditional pardon. And I want to talk to you about pardons specifically with this governor. He's been uh, um, the most active governor with pardons uh, um, than the three previous governors combined. And so this governor is not uh, is quite receptive to pardons and as compared to other governors in the past. Gray Davis didn't issue one pardon. I think Pete Wilson just did a couple and Duke Mason, I think, began the whole process of refusing to issue any pardons. Uh, Governor Schwarzenegger actually has, and so uh, in, in that regard, props to him. Um, it's an application uh, for clemency. You have to obtain it through the governor's office. I didn't include uh, paperwork in this area. It's not often that uh, we're asked to do this um, uh, for our indigent clients to get a pardon. Obviously, we do it in the capital end of it, but local public defender offices don't do the pardon route. It's usually appellate lawyers that do this in death penalty cases. And um, my clients being indigent, uh, if they've gotten to the point where they're acceptable candidates for a pardon, they usually have a pretty good job, and there are private lawyers that do pardons. And so our offices don't do them very often. Uh, and I've never done one before, and it's a stretch of our resources to do it as well, too, because as you can see, they're fairly extensive in uh, what you need to do. Um, you have the, the, the pardon again starts as the uh, certificate did with the DA. Uh, you, uh, if, um, if you've been con convicted of more felonies in different proceedings in different uh, counties, the Supreme Court has to sign off on it, and then it goes off to the board of prison terms for an investigation. And they do, the board does an extensive uh, review, and if uh, they believe that uh, you're sufficient for pardon, then they give the pardon uh, to the governor to sign or not. Uh, pardons are used for those residing outside the state that don't, uh, don't meet the residency requirements that the Certificate of Rehabilitation require. It also uh, applies to those sex offenses. Um, I don't know very many governors who will touch that third rail of politics right now with sex offenders, and I know Governor Schwarzenegger, the one thing he does, take a big stand against the sex offenders, and understandably so. Again, they don't uh, waste the pardon uh, process on misdemeanors because it's just too extensive uh, uh, use of government resources to use for misdemeanors. and. Um, and so that's where the pardons are. The benefits are is that you can serve on juries again and restore, restore um, your uh, felony, your, your firearm rights, but that's only um, state rights. You have to go and get your separate federal approval otherwise, and that's a big trip up. Uh, even if you get your state gun rights restored, there are all sorts of federal rules that exist about it as well, too. And so. Um, just because uh, you've gone through the dismissal process or this relief process doesn't mean you'll necessarily get your gun, guns back. Me personally, I, you know, the less guns out there the better, but uh, it's something that uh, you can get your, your gun rights restored. We're working on someone's uh, relief right now on the state level so that he can get his, he's a big hunter, he wants to hunt, uh, even though he's got a felony conviction in his background, we're trying to help him do that. Um, it, uh, and the other interesting thing is that it allows felons to become county probation officers, uh, but not uh, but not police officers. And in some ways, that's good because uh, if you have an ex felon that's a probation officer, uh, they'll have that uh, true experience to be able to counsel uh, my clients that much more effectively. It also relieves them of uh, registration, as we've talked about in the past. The drawback is it doesn't erase or seal your record of conviction. It remains a prior conviction as uh, has been consistent throughout the other relief as well, too. You still have to uh, admit it as a conviction to your employers. Uh, it doesn't necessarily restore your firearm rights, nor it certainly doesn't for dangerous weapon offenses, and it doesn't prevent deportations. Just because the state governor thinks you're a good person, uh, the ICE, the federal ICE uh, immigration, they don't really, they don't have to follow that. Um, this is the big one that everyone uh, ultimately wants to hear, 
and it's really the most disappointing. And I know we only have about a few minutes left, so um, but I'll, uh, I'll spend some time on it. I know we have about eight minutes left, and so uh, we'll have a little time with this. But it really is disappointing uh, that this is the relief that most of you want, but is uh, the hardest to get and um, is the most inadequate. Uh, there are two ways of sealing or destroying your records. There's uh, adults under Penal Code Section 851.8. And that only allows you to seal or destroy records of arrest or detention where you're factually innocent. And um, we'll talk about that in a second. The other area uh, that I know I took advantage of when I was a youth is sealing your juvenile record. And uh, that is um, pretty universal, ironclad, and um, is important for anyone that has a juvenile record to do. You should know that uh, having a juvenile record, um, it's not a, like an adult criminal conviction. You, you're not convicted as a juvenile. It's a civil proceeding, and you're found a ward of the court. So it's a huge distinction in the law that makes a big difference for um, application processes. So uh, if you get your juvenile record sealed, it's almost impo impossible for any public to get access to juvenile records. And in rare instances, um, uh, DAs and uh, criminal defense attorneys can have access to it, but we have to petition to be able to do it. And there's a, a great uh, guard is kept on juvenile records to uh, protect juveniles who uh, have a youthful indiscretion that they've since become more mature and learned and gone beyond. Um, but you've got to get that record sealed uh, and to make sure it's sealed. We'll talk about adults first. Um, the adult requirements are that you've been arrested, but it didn't result in a conviction, and that you're factually innocent of the charges, and that two or more years have not gone by before you've made this motion. And if two or more years have gone by, then uh, you better have a good exp explanation of why you waited and why the prosecution has not been prejudiced by the delay. Because if there's delay and the police reports have been uh, destroyed because of the usual government just destruction uh, processes or uh, witnesses have been lost that were uh, helpful to the prosecution, uh, the courts are going to be hard pressed to allow you to have this sealing of the record. Factually innocent also is a difficult concept. You could theoretically uh, gone through a trial, be found not guilty by a jury, and still the court would consider you not factually innocent of the charges. Because when you're found not guilty of, uh, of an offense by a jury, it doesn't mean that you're factually innocent of the charges. It just means that the government hasn't presented sufficient evidence to find you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, I've seen some creative lawyers actually put in a jury instruction requesting a specific finding that their client has been found factually innocent, and that's a way of getting around that. But other than that really rare instance, uh, a trial judges um, are usually loathe to find factually innocent uh, someone who's been arrested uh, because they think that there's, where there's smoke, there's fire. Uh, but uh, if you've been arrested and there's been no um, accusatory pleadings, and you want to clear your record, you know, we have these situations in domestic violence cases all the time where uh, the police officers arrest whoever called, that they arrest um, whomever they come upon first and whomever wasn't the one that called, and then they sort out the facts later in court. Uh, but if you get a domestic violence uh, offense as an arrest on your record, it's kind of a hard thing to explain that no, it was really this or that, and you'll have an employer with a John side looking at you going, well, you know, I see maybe a little smoke as well, too. It's, uh, so that's a big issue, and this is in these instances where you want to do it. Uh, you have to file a petition with the police department uh, first, and then the DA is to seal the record, and if they don't act upon it, uh, it's deemed denied, and then you have to uh, go to court to get the order of arrest uh, uh, to seal. Um, if you're successful uh, with uh, um, explaining to the courts and they're agreeing with you that you're factually innocent, then you take that order to uh, the law enforcement agency and to the DA's office and they have to destroy any record that relates to that offense. 
Now, you know, I'm I'm just a really cynical public defender, so, uh, 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 public defender, and I just cannot believe that the police department uh, voluntarily destroys records. I mean, they say they may do, but I gotta believe they got a separate book, just like Al Capone had his separate accounting book. I gotta believe that the police departments, the Department of Justice, and the FBI keep a separate book of this information, and they access it when they want. Uh, but, uh, you know, you have to take face value that they are doing what they say they're doing. And um, if you get this factual innocence claim, then you can say that you've never been arrested uh, to anybody and to everybody. As for juveniles, uh, you have a right to uh, seal your record completely five or more years after juvenile jurisdiction has been terminated, or if you reach the age of 18, and then you can request the records be sealed. Uh, there, uh, the probation department uh, does a review, and uh, they seal the records uh, from the Superior Court, the probation department, and the law enforcement agency that uh, um, did the arrest. And uh, the court uh, holds a hearing, and if it's granted, uh, it's granted if the minor is rehabilitated and he hasn't been convicted of any future crime of a moral turpitude, uh, uh, turpitude any crime involving theft or, or serious moral lax behavior uh, since terminating juvenile jurisdiction. And that's where we get, hooked, uh, we get um, hooked up on. A lot of our juveniles get in trouble shortly after becoming an adult, and so that seals their fate in having their juvenile records sealed. It prevents us from doing it. Uh, the benefit, again, is that you can state to any governmental or private entity that you've never been convicted of any offense. And again, if you're convicted as a juvenile, it's really not a conviction in the adult sense. It's uh, an admission to a petition. It's a civil proceeding. It's not a criminal proceeding. And so there's uh, that important distinction. The drawbacks are that it can be used as a prior conviction in the future uh, uh, as an adult, especially, and, and in fact, um, we just had a heartbreaking loss in the U.S. Supreme Court that they denied review, uh, they denied cert, uh, uh, certification on People versus New Win, which challenged the use of using juvenile strike priors as adult strike priors to enhance sentences, and so uh, that's an issue that we're going to have to continue to fight for some time in the future. But that's the drawback of a juvenile record. My resources, uh, here are the resources that I've mainly accessed to uh, understand uh, this information. I really want to give props to the San Francisco Public Defender's Office for their Clean Slate program. It's just been a tremendous help for me. It's a great program where they have, a, 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 once a month they have lawyers, and they have an intake sheet, and uh, you go and fill out this intake sheet, and they counsel you, and then you come back, in a month uh, after the Public Defender's Office has gotten your uh, Department of Justice rap sheet, and then they tell you what relief they can and can't give you, and you, then in a couple months they'll have filed and obtained the relief that you have. Orange County has done a, a similar program with the new lead program. I'm trying to do one myself uh, in, um, in Monterey County. Uh, uh, governmental agencies like the Sacramento Public Defender's Office, I mean, Public Law Office has their program. I also want to um, uh, accent the Legal Aid Center, the ABA, uh, the Volunteer uh, Services Program in Northern California, and the California Courts, their self-help center. Their materials were really good explaining about it in uh, in a, in, a, in a way that's understandable that uh, you all could uh, help explain to your clients and how to move through the process. Finally, there are clients that you have that fa have families that have some money or are from money that can pri um, pay a private lawyer to usher through quicker, faster, better so that your client can get the mental health uh, 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 subsidies that they need, uh, the SSI or whatever, uh, and a little money up front to a private lawyer to gain all the access to the resources of the federal or state governments once the record has been cleaned up is probably money well spent. I want to tell you, 
the law offices of Jerome Mullins, uh, he's probably the foremost expert in California right now as a private lawyer to uh, handle these types of um, uh, motions in court. So if you want to get really quick action with someone who knows the stuff, I consult with him all the time when I'm confused about a particular issue. He's very um, uh, forthcoming and very receptive to phone calls. And uh, like I said, he's the one that turned me on to the fact that this should be a social movement that we need to uh, redo the laws of California to to assist and to um, to somehow benefit our clients better than what we have currently uh, to help expunge or uh, remove the stigma of uh, the scarlet letter that California has been obsessed with for the last 35 years. So with that, are there any other questions that anyone has? I know we're at the end of our time. I've gone the full hour and a half, uh, but I'm willing to take any. Muted. Hello, any questions? Any other questions? Hello? Donna, are there any questions? Hello? Hi there. Can you hear Hi. me now? I can. All right. I think that um, everyone is muted, including Donna, and looks like she's logged off. So what we'll do is we've had a question scroll bar um, going throughout the whole seminar. So we will, if you have a question, put it in that question box, and then we will answer it in sort of a FAQ sheet, and we'll send it out to all participants on the web webinar as well as on our website. It will be posted on two websites, the Workforce Education and Training website on CIMH and then the Working Well Together website. Since there's no way to facilitate and I don't, I think Donna has logged off. So thank you so much for your presentation and thank it you. looks like we are done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.